Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about impedance matching and coupled inductors by performing some experiments related to the previous two videos. I want to look at how coupling factor can be measured, how the bandwidth of the transformer can be evaluated, and assess the benefits that you can get from resonant coupling. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So, first off, coupling factor. In an older video, I prepared a set of transformers and I measured them using an inductance ohmmeter built into a multimeter. So, one way of measuring coupling factor is to see the inductance of the primary when the secondary is in an open circuit and then short circuit the secondary and remeasure the primary inductance. From these two values, you can determine the k factor based on this equation. Now, the main idea behind this measurement is that when the secondary is in a short circuit, you are basically measuring the equivalent uncoupled inductance of the transformer, since the equivalent coupled inductance is short circuited on the secondary side. Now, knowing this and the open circuit inductance, you can work out the exact coupling factor. But in practice, there are some extra details that need to be taken into account. Now, there are two problems with this approach that need to be taken into consideration. So first of all, when you're short-circuiting the secondary of the transformer, you don't really have an ideal short circuit. So you still have some equivalent series resistance because of the wires. So this can be in the order of milliohms to ohms depending on the number of turns and wire thickness that you are using. And secondly, the frequency at which you are performing the measurement also has an impact on the result. And to show this, I prepared a set of simulations for this particular transformer that has a 1 to 1 turns ratio 100 microhenries on both sides, and a coupling factor of 0.5. So if we would have the secondary as an open circuit, we would be measuring 100 microhenries, so this is the primary inductance. If the secondary would be short-circuited, we would have 75 microhenries, and we have the impedance curve of that. But if we look at the actual transformer and see how this behaves, so what is the impedance measured from the primary side when the secondary is short-circuited, we get a strange result. So at low frequencies, so in red, we're seeing the same impedance as for the primary without any secondary, and only at higher frequencies are we actually getting the response of a 75 microhenry inductor. Then in the middle there's this transition period where the impedance moves from one to the other. Now another interesting thing that we can put on our graph is the response of a 1 ohm resistor. So this is the equivalent series resistance that we have. And this is cutting right in the middle of our graph. So this cyan line in the middle. So what we're seeing here is a limitation caused by the bandwidth of the transformer. At very low frequencies, because of the load of the transformer and the magnetizing inductance on the primary, you're not really seeing the secondary. So only at high frequencies does the transformer actually work like a transformer and you can actually influence the primary inductance using the secondary short circuit. So this method is very good as long as you can use a high enough frequency to perform an accurate measurement. If your measurement frequency is too low, then you will not be getting good results. Now another better way of performing this coupling factor measurement is by sweeping an input signal on the primary side and measuring the response on the secondary side. And from this to observe the ratio between input and output signal on the transformer. Knowing the turns ratio, this will both show the coupling factor, but also the bandwidth of the transformer. So where do you actually get the good coupling? So this will require a bit more complex equipment to build in real life, so you will need a variable input signal source. So it's a bit more complex than just using a regular multimeter, but it will give better results in the end. So if we run this measurement on the same transformer, here I'm also simulating for multiple coupling factors, so we get the ideal one, 0.5 and 1, we can see three different results. Now this measurement of course will be impacted by the various loads that are present, so the output load and the series load on the signal generator, but this is not necessarily a bad thing since you can set the actual use case impedances and get the most valuable information about your particular transformer. So if we neglect the series resistances of the inductors, we can say that the coupling factor is equal to the ratio between the real use case and the ideal use case. So for a one-to-one -one transformer with ideal coupling, so this 
green line, we have a coupling of about minus 6 decibels. If we move to the 0 0.5 coupling value, so the red line, so this is for the coupling of 0 0.5, then we're getting minus 12. So 6 decibels lower than with the ideal case. And if we go to an even lower coupling factor, say 0 0.1, then we're getting minus 26. So this is 20 decibels lower than the ideal case. And this type of measurement is the one that I will be focusing on today. So for today's experiments, I will be using a signal generator coupled with an oscilloscope that together can sweep an input signal's frequency and then measure two signals and compare them to plot out the amplitude relationship and the phase relationship. So to create a Bode plot. So what I will be doing is injecting an input signal, measuring it with the first channel of the oscilloscope, passing it through a 50 ohm series resistor. So this represents the internal impedance of a signal source. And this is separate from whatever is inside the signal generator. Then the signal passes through this resistor into a 50 ohm load, which again is being measured by the second channel of the oscilloscope. So first, just to verify that the setup is correct and that the resistor values are correct, we can perform a baseline measurement just to see what the response of this setup is. So normally we're expecting a flat minus six decibel response. And if we perform the measurement and have an actual look, this will take a while, of course, I'm measuring between 10 kilohertz and 10 megahertz. So over three decades with 10 measurement points per decade. So I put only these many points to keep the measurement quite fast. And if we now look through the list of actual measured points, we can see that we're not getting exactly minus six decibels. It's about minus 5.6 to 5.7, 5.8. So it's not perfect, but it's good enough for our measurements today. Now, this sort of baseline measurement is quite important to be performed, especially if you want to make very precise measurements. So this sort of data should be used as calibration data to which you compare whatever other measurements you do. And this way you can take into account whatever tolerances the various measurement equipment and resistors and so on have. So now let's measure something a bit more interesting. So what I have here is a one-to-one -one transformer that has the coils quite separated one from the other and there is no magnetic core. So this is an air core inductor. And if we rerun our sweep with this setup, we can already see that we're getting a completely different response. Now last time, we're nowhere near hitting the minus six decibels, but what we are getting is the typical response of a transformer. So we have a low side corner frequency and then we have a high side corner frequency. So the high side being limited by the parallel capacitance. Now, if we scroll through the data a bit and we look for the maximum signal that was achieved, so we have about minus 22.5.6 decibels. So we are 16.9 decibels below our reference point, which is giving us a coupling factor of 14.28%. And previously with the multimeter, I measured 14.4%. So the two values are very close together. And one of the things that's helping us with this is that our peak response is at relatively low frequency. So below 100 kilohertz. Now let's move on and also add the magnetic core to this transformer to see how this changes things. So now I added the magnetic core. I also changed the frequency span so we can go down to 10 hertz so we can better see the low frequency behavior. And if we now rerun the simulation and wait. So first of all, we can see we are getting a much nicer curve. We have quite a wide flat area, which is reaching minus seven and above decibels. So we're having much better coupling this time. And if we go through the various points, we are getting about minus 6.5 dB when the maximum coupling was reached. So this is only about 0.8 decibels lower than the signal level that we were achieving just with the resistors. So this is giving us a 91.2% coupling. Now, also what's important to observe is that we've expanded our bandwidth quite a lot to low frequencies. So this maximum area is occurring between somewhere just below one kilohertz and up to a few dozen kilohertz. So the previous peak coupling that we were getting was at 100 kilohertz, where we're still getting the similar values. So adding the core added more inductance and this improved our low frequency behavior. 
Now, as some of you pointed out, the core material has a critical impact in the performance of the transformer. So some core material data sheets like this one from TDK, so this is for the T38 material, will tell you not just the permeability of the material, so 10,000 in this case, but they will also tell you how the material behaves at different frequencies. So this 10,000 value is not a constant. So what we get is this sort of graphs of complex permeability that show us the real part of the permeability, so this solid line, which indicates the magnetic permeability that creates inductance, so storing magnetic energy and then giving it back to the system, but it also gives you the imaginary permeability, this dashed line, which still impacts the circuit, so the inductor will store energy, but it will not give it back, but rather turn it into heat. And as you can see, up until a point, the real permeability is predominant, so the inductor will behave inductively if it's built with the sort of core, but at higher frequencies, first of all, the inductor will behave resistive, and then all permeability will drop off. Now, there's far more parameters that impact permeability, and these need to be taken into account when you're choosing a magnetic core for your particular application. So depending on the operating frequencies of your circuit, one core or another will be more effective. Now, before moving on, I would just like to show you one more transformer. So this is a one-to-one -one transformer that has a bifiler winding technique applied. So the turns are wound at the same time, one next to the other. And previously I measured this using the multimeter and it gave me about 75.8% of coupling. But now if we measure it with our Bode plot setup, and we wait of course for it, we can see that we are getting an extremely good coupling. So if we scroll through it, we are reaching minus 5.9, so very close to ideal coupling, but this is only occurring at very high frequencies. So this is one case in which the transformer actually has very good coupling, but if you're not measuring it at the correct frequency, you're not going to see this coupling. But anyway, let's now also see how this transformer behaves with the magnetic core. So I'm using the exact same core that we used for the previous measurement, and again, if we wait a bit. So we can see this time that again we're getting very good coupling, so in the minus 6 range over a very wide bandwidth, we can see that high frequency behavior was not really affected, so the parallel capacitance of the windings stayed the same. We are getting this resonance spike here, but it's at very high frequency, so that doesn't really matter. But what we can see again is that by adding the magnetic core, bandwidth has been expanded quite a lot to the lower frequencies. So this particular transformer has quite a flat response over almost four decades. So it's quite a nice wideband application of transformers. And now let's also try some actual impedance matching. So I took the same transformer that we previously measured, the one-to-one -one bifiler wound transformer, but rather than connecting it as a one-to-one -one transformer, I connected the secondary to the primary. And basically what I have is an unisolated one-to-two transformer. And for that, I left the 50 ohm series impedance on the input, but I changed the output to a 200 ohm fixed value resistor. So if we had the previous setup, so the one-to-one -one transformer, we should have gotten minus six decibels on the output, so half the input signal. But since we have a one to two turns ratio, the signal amplitude should be double. So double of half should be exactly the same as we started off with. So we should be getting around zero decibels. So if we run the measurement to see actually what happens, again I'm measuring from 100 hertz up to 10 megahertz, so we can see the bandwidth of the transformer end of the system. So again we can see a very nice, very flat response, and if we look at the actual values once it's stable, it's at around minus 71 millidecibels. So we're very close to the zero decibels that we should be getting. So this can be explained by the resistor tolerances and, well, certain losses that still occur in the transformer. But anyway, we are getting our impedance matching. So now let's move on to resonant coupling. I already started the measurement. So what I have here is a intermediate frequency transformer from an old radio. This was built for 455 kilohertz, but I did remove the capacitors. So right now we're just measuring the transformer by itself. And as loads, I removed the 50 ohm loads that we had previously and went for something a bit larger. So this was not designed for 50 ohms. So I have a 10 kilo ohm resistor load on the output and a 10 kilo ohm series resistor on the input. 
So both 10 kilo ohms input and output because this is a one-to-one -one transformer. So now if we look at the measurement, I set it from well, 11 kilohertz up to 10 megahertz. And we can see that we're getting a spike at around a few megahertz. So this is where the peak coupling is appearing. And if we are going through the measurement points, we can see that the peak is at around minus 39 decibels. So we are about 33.5 decibels below the minus 6 dB line that would represent an ideal coupling. So without any resonance, we are getting 2% coupling with this transformer. So now let's see how we can improve on this. And knowing that this was built for 455 kilohertz and 455 is below this resonance peak, we should be using parallel capacitors. And well, we can use the old capacitors that this transformer came with. So what I have here is some old 300 picofarad capacitors. So let's add these one at a time and see how this improves things. So I added the 300 picofarad capacitor on the input and if we wait for the measurement to get performed. So now we can clearly see that there's a resonance peak at around 4 500 kilohertz. We can see that it's around minus 49 decibels, but we are not really getting a clear picture. So since this is a quite narrow band circuit and I'm using 10 points per decade, we aren't getting the full picture yet. So I will reset the device to just look at this narrow portion of frequency, so between 400 and 600 kilohertz, let's say, and then we will reassess. So now I also added far more measurement points so we can see that we are measuring every roughly 3 to 400 hertz. This will give us a measurement with far more resolution. And again, if we wait a bit, so even without waiting for the measurement to finish, we can see we are getting a very clear spike so we're at minus 43.7 decibels at 456.7 kilohertz. So very close to where this circuit was initially designed to operate. But now we can move on and see how this behaves with double resonance. So if we add the second capacitor also on the output, does this response get any better? So now with double resonance, we can see that our peak response is 447 kilohertz, so slightly lower. So this just means that the two tuned circuits are not really adjusted correctly. But regardless, we're at minus 27 decibels this time. So we're much better than before. And of course we can get even better if the two resonant circuits are properly tuned. So this is one of the difficulties with using double tuned transformers. And that is that the two sides need to be tuned at exactly the same frequency. Now, even though this transformer was not designed for 50 ohm operation, that doesn't mean we can't measure it and try it out. So I reset the initial setup with the 50 ohm series resistor and the 50 ohm load. And if we rerun the measurement, so starting from one kilohertz up to 10 megahertz, just to see where our peak response is appearing, well, it's appearing quite early. So because of the very small resistance coupled with the inductance and capacitance in the system, all of the resonance frequencies have been moved to lower values. So we are still getting some sort of resonance at around one megahertz. But other than that, we are getting a peak response minus 49.3 decibels at 20 kilohertz. So now if we want to turn this transformer into a 450 kilohertz intermediate frequency transformer again, we can apply the same resonance principle. But since our desired resonance frequency is at higher frequencies than the self resonance, we now need to add the capacitor in series. So if we try that, if we apply the two capacitors, so I'll be using the same 300 picofarads and we'll directly go to double resonance. So again, we can see that not much signal passes through the circuit except at the resonance frequency. So we can achieve both series or parallel resonance depending on the loads. And here I've gotten about minus 42 dB of signal but we can zoom in again and perform a far more accurate measurement. But the point is that depending on where the self resonance of the transformer is, you will need to add either series or parallel capacitors. In both case, you can still reach resonance. Now, although this is something that we should have started off with, we can now look at our latest experiments in the circuit simulator, just to confirm the behaviors that we've observed. So to start off, I prepared this model in which I have a transformer, 430 microhenry inductors, coupling factor of 2%, and I'm connecting an AC signal source through an impedance, and I'm matching the output 
with the same impedance and these two resistors have two values that we will play around with, so 10 kilo ohms and 50 ohms. So if we run the simulation as is, and we look at the results, so you can see that we have two different output curves. So one that's showing a peak response at around 18 kilohertz, so this is with the 50 ohm impedances, and the other one showing a peak response at around 3-4 megahertz, and this is the one with the 10 kilo ohm impedances. So we can see, just like in real life, that the impedance values are influencing the peak responses of the transformers. But regardless, the exact peak response is dependent on the coupling factor. It's just that with the load, you can move it left or right a bit. Now we can see how adding capacitors is influencing us. So adding a single parallel capacitor will give us a peak response in the case where we have the 10 kilo ohm impedance. And on the other curve, so the blue one, where we have 50 ohms, nothing really happens. So this is because the self resonance of the transformer is at lower frequencies than the resonance frequency that we're creating. Following up on this, if we add double resonance, so two capacitors, we can see an even stronger response. So again, this is with the 10 kilo ohm impedance, with the 50 ohms, nothing happens. And finally, if we look at the two series capacitors, again, we see a resonance frequency, but if we check it out, this is the curve in which we had the 50 ohm impedance. So with low impedances, the capacitor topology needed to create resonance is the series one. Having high impedances gives us this cyan curve which does not show any resonances. In the end, using transformers as isolated or non-isolated, narrow or wideband impedance matching circuits is quite an important use case for this type of component. Now, at the same time, knowing the exact coupling factor is not just necessary in radio frequency circuits, but also in any other application where a transformer is needed, like in power converters. Once the exact parameters of the transformer are known, you can first check the behavior of your circuit in the circuit simulator, and then move on to the real life thing. And as always, even if the two don't perfectly match, at least the simulator will make it easier to try out different ideas and get a sense of what's going on. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on all videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.